Power Athlete Nation. What's happening? Tex here, and I'm joined by longtime Power Athlete Block One coach and even longer Doctor of Physical Therapy, Mr. Matt Zanis. What's going on, dude? Don't forget, even a really good buddy of yourself, too. Yeah, well, I mean, coach first. Coach first. Yeah. But then long standing friendship and pal. Good old Second. buddy, old pal. Second. Yeah, why not? Yeah. Travel, up there. adventures, the coaching with one another in different seminars with people whose performance matters. Yes. Also, roommate. Cool. <laughs> At, yes. While you're in town, you <laughs> yeah, become a roommate. We don't live together, folks. No. Well, today we are sitting down and, and speaking to movement. And in particular, one of our Power Athlete Accessory Programs, Iron Flex. Mm -hmm. yes. And the why we have Matt in here, we're going to explore different purposes of breathing, why you need to warm up, which I'm also going to go off on, and then quality why quality movement matters. Mm -hmm. It's not just a matter of finding a program you enjoy in that training experience, but aiming for lack of a better term, tissue quality, long-term health, being able to follow that program without any breaks, moving well. Um, are you ready? Ready, ready. Let's do awesome. this thing. So what is Iron Flex? Very quickly, accessory program that Power Athlete offers with quality movement in mind. Now we have a weekly program set out within Iron Flex. So Mondays, Tuesdays, Wednesdays, all of these days within a week have a certain intention. We pick one barbell movement a week and then give you the opportunity to really unlock it through different movement throughout the week as 10, 15, 20 minutes, however long you want to partake in this. And so Iron Flex is that program. Bolt on to any of our Power Athlete training programs. No weight room required, no equipment required and aimed at improving your movement, and we choose one barbell a week, finding common limitations within there, and then give you different routines to tack on that then target limitations of the barbell. So a lot of fun programming and writing it because you get to see the, the, the barbell in action, anticipate where people will fail, and then give them nothing but opportunity to then correct it. A lot of folks use this program as their warm-up. Many of our programs... Do not offer warm up. Johnny Bot, Johnny Wad is an example. It's just throwing you right into the strength training. Well, Iron Flex is that opportunity. Bolt on this program as your movement warm up, and then it prepares you for then your barbell action for the day on Johnny Watt. So that's that's just one example. And then there's plenty of others of how people apply this program as their movement therapy, meaning they hit their training in the AM. And then movement therapy in the evening, their extra 10, 15 minutes to themselves before they go to sleep to then wind down and then practice that way. So it's many different uses throughout people's experience on this program, whether it's warm up or essentially just its own little therapy program so they can stay loose and athletic. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it, you know, you mentioned um, all the different uses for an iron flex program and i think it is extremely powerful as a tool not just for warming up or even for cooling down for that matter but also as a self-assessment mm. right and you know with great power becomes great responsibility peter parker right Interesting. i well no people told that to peter to parker but that's semantics but then he died right away, or his so. or his aunt was technically his uncle his uncle yeah that's right uh -huh. his uncle and then his aunt in this most uncle recent ben. one <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, it depends on what universe we're speaking of, but whatever. Oh, Semantics. It's complicated now. But anyway, that assessment piece is extremely valuable, and it's something that I've actually been using since like 2011. Your Girl, personal like, assessment. Personal assessment, yeah. Because um, I started following Power Athlete back in the old CrossFit football days, but when I was actually in PT school. And it was the warm ups and dynamic movement prep that I really latched onto and start to utilize as a window to view people's movement limitations from. Mm -hmm. To be able to pick up on the functional limitations that each athlete or each you know client or or patient that I had come in through the doors, what was what was the limiting factor that was restricting them one from um, their movement and re, you know relating to their movement capacity in the gym, but also relating back to their pain experience as well. What were the pieces of the puzzle? You know the limitations in their movement literacy that they were missing that was the source of the problem. I think utilizing something like that is extremely powerful because then you can use it to listen to your own body. 
Mm -hmm. right? This idea of attunement where you can now feel into your body, is it moving well? And can we actually locate these limitations on our own each and every day while we're training? And then the most important part is to be able to integrate that. Right? Can you fix it? Can you integrate that into the bigger picture of the movement with the barbell? Yeah. And what Matt's speaking to back in the day, we had a seminar where we travel the world and teach people how to teach people to lift weights. And within it, we had different warm ups, quote unquote. I'm using air quotes for our listeners. If you want to check us out, check us out Spotify video. But anyway, the warm ups were assessment tools for us as coaches and how they were broken down. Meaning if we were going to go about to teach the barbell back squat, we wouldn't dive into the barbell back squat. We lead off with a warm up that became an assessment for us as coaches. We take four different pieces, components of the back squat. We break them apart and then teach this for 60 minutes as a four movement warm up, teaching people what to look for, different aspects of the ankle, the hip position, the back, and what these things meant for them. Right? We care. Uh, it's not about getting to squat below parallel right now. It's a matter of getting you to eventually squat below parallel. So this movement tool and assessment that we'd break down allowed you to see where an athlete would squat today. The beauty is it's not only the assessment, it's also the corrective exercises. And then we'd put people in a position, break apart, see where they would fail in their squat, where they were going to in their squat, and then we allowed them to squat. So that essence that we had as assessment for the individuals right in front of us, that became the Iron Flex program, breaking apart barbell movements into different components, allowing you to self-assess each component and then bring it all together within the training. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Think about that, this, uh, provide everybody an example here. A lot of people do experience back pain with training, and this is something we talk about ad nauseum, right? Mm -hmm. Well, what is something that we can look at with the iron flex that might give us a clue or an idea as to why you keep experiencing back pain after you deadlift or you squat? Okay, or after maybe even sprints, for example, mm -hmm. something like a Spider-Man position, which is awesome because you can then look at all three planes of motion. Way to bring it back. Right. Yeah. See, look at that. I like that transition. All right. To explain this quick Spider-Man yeah. position. Now imagine my orientation. I'm eyes down in a push-up position. I got a wider base within my feet, not heels together push-up position. Heels outside my shoulders, toes forward, push-up position. And then I step my right foot up and outside of my right hand. My knee is staying over my arch, my instep, but it's driving forward out over my toes. I'm not driving that knee outside my foot box. From there, we have a good perspective. Now take your vision to the side, watching Spider-Man crawl up the wall. From here, we see the back position. Is it rounded? Is it neutral? Is their head craning up? Is their hip below parallel? Is it above parallel? What's going on there? So that's what Matt's bringing us to, that side view mm -hmm. where I step up and outside my hand. Yep. And it, it's great because, you know, that, that Spider-Man, we could look at those three different planes of motion. So the very nature of getting into the position you just described is our Y axis, mm -hmm. right? And that from there, we start to look at the trunk. Can it move through sagittal, frontal, and transverse planes? Um, but to bring it back around to that, that back example, because that's something I use, you know, day in and day out with all my athletes, even at the, the Olympic level, is we put them in that Spider-Man position. Let's just take them from the, what you just described, you know, let's just say left legs forward, right knees back, right hips back. Can they actually achieve hip extension? Is that possible, right? Is the knee underneath the hip? Can it get back behind there? If it gets back behind there, what does the low back look like? Oh yeah. Right? Is the foot turned out? Are we into circumduction of the hip? Is it actually rotated because they can't achieve hip extension? And already you're starting to look at these pieces of the puzzle and say, oh wow, well, if the hip can't extend, the brain is a really smart tool inside the body, right? It's still going to allow us to achieve Some the position. Of them, yeah. Some, it depends. Depends on the character. Um, but we're going to achieve the position we want to achieve. It just We just might get there in a different way. And that's what we utilize as the term compensation patterns, right? Ah, yeah. So then we're going to extend through the low back, maybe extend through the upper back, or the TL junction, where the you know, like thoracic spine kind of comes into the low back. And mm -hmm. that's where we start to see a lot of issues because we know that they can't access the hips. So we're going to use their low back for everything. But then that also gives us then the tool to start programming for, program for them specifically to start to fix that limitation as well. Mm -hmm. So I think it's, it's, you know, it's extremely powerful, not just the warm, but also as that assessment for the individual. Yes. And the corrective exercises. And the corrective exercise. Now, speaking of quality movement, how long would it take for someone to start to see results mm. simply by adding this to, say, a workout program? 
This well, that, becomes your warm up. How long before I start to see improvements in my ability to move? Well, that's what's beautiful about the nervous system. You can make some pretty quick changes right away. And we see this uh, idea of what we call neuromuscular efficiency mm -hmm. develop within like two to three weeks. That's pretty quick, right? And that's essentially your brain sending new neural pathways into these patterns. It's yep. starting so, to ingrain them. Yes, deep dive this neurological efficiency, and then I'll express what it feels like as a numbskull athlete. <laughs> so to get sciencey on y'all, please, it is the brain, like I said, sending these new neural pathways. You are literally growing new synapses of how the cells and the nerves communicate with each other. Okay. You know, we're having a conversation right now here, Tex. We're using the English language to communicate. Right. The way that our body communicates, the way our nervous system communicates is through force and load. That's how the cells communicate. So in order to make any appreciable changes, we then need to put our body into these positions and stress them out. And quite honestly, when you look at this dynamic movement prep stuff, you know, we're all really great at using a form of external resistance to move our body, but many of us can't move our own joints against gravity, the, ex the resistance that's acting on us every single day. Mm -hmm. So usually that's a, a high enough stress in the moment to make those quick neurological changes. Now, once you make those quick neurological changes, that's where you then need to progress, right? You need to stress to progress and start to overload again in those patterns to then ingrain them so that you own those positions. Yes. And two notes on that. One, how we stress and progress iron flex mm -hmm. while I have this in our head. You begin with one round and how it's programmed and written to say one to three rounds, one to four rounds. So we say, all right, start with one. And then if you feel the, I mean, your chili is hot, you're breaking a sweat, you feel that tension. Okay, maybe it's one today or one seesaw walk or Spider-Man feels like what the, that's where you are today. Then the next, next week or next opportunity for this, then you're going to come back and then do two rounds and we're progressing up stress to progress. Um, now going back to what this feels like as an athlete, let's hear it. You can't do it. Your body catches. There is this amount of tension that, that switches on and turns on to protect yourself from failure, from fault, from inability to execute this usually starts in the hands and we get this weird strong hand anybody seen scary movie two throwback reference but you start to get this weird grip strong hand when you're trying to Take execute a new skill yeah my germs <laughs> but then you know think now chubbs peterson happy gilmore reference ease the tension babe we need you to relax so the more you execute these movements the more we want it to be seamless and effortless which then we need to add the stress to then progress. But before we add the set reps, which we're going to get into momentarily, mm -hmm. it needs to be executed. And we'll, we'll hack the breath here to allow us to relax into these different positions to seamless then transition through our three planes of motion. But yeah, if you feel like, oh my God, that was hard. That was tense. There's no way this should be that hard. We're in a good place for a beginner. And now we just need to expose you more opportunity through these movements to then it becomes seamless, effortless. And then we can add different forms of stress, time under tension, reps, mm -hmm. planes of motion, or load. Yeah. And actually what, what I love about this too, you just brought up a really good point about it essentially being a starting point where people can start to learn about their bodies. And what you just mentioned there was essentially like a sympathetic overload, right? Your brain is freaking out. It's mm -hmm. that fight, flight, or freeze defense. So gripping the fists, one thing that we're going to cover on here too is the breath. Yep. Many people hold their breath. That's a big no-no, right? That is not useful for you. You're not getting any oxygen. You're not owning your positions at that point. There's this old saying, the breath is the king of the brain. The brain is the king of the body. If you can breathe fully into a position, you then own that position. Now you can utilize it as part of your movement literacy. Yes, right? and that's... Reading this right down the line. Exactly. And it's uh, from a scientific standpoint, we have studies that show that you need to be able to take at least 90% of your total tidal volume, which means the amount of air that you can move into your lungs and out through your lungs. And then also from a, a pain perception standpoint, you get into these positions, it's creating a novelty effect, right? Explain. It's variety. Okay. We know that the healthiest organisms are the ones that can move in the most variety of ways, right? Just like the healthiest individuals are the ones that eat the widest variety of foods. 
The okay. supplest of leopards. The yeah. supplest of leopards, right? We get more movement options to work with, which essentially then gives your body more options to move into. It then allows you to redistribute the load, the stress, the tension throughout your nervous system, throughout the tissues like the tendons, ligaments, muscles, joint surfaces, which is actually a really important one. Mm-hmm. It's, it's why you see powerlifters get hip and knee replacements by the time they're like 45. Right, because they're utilizing the same joint surface over and over and over again. They're likely never going into a Spider-Man position, right? They're never exposing the hip into these different ranges of motion. So this novelty effect is usually what you need to break that pain cycle. It's enough to say, oh, hey, we can move in different ways and we can keep moving. And it helps to calm down that fear response that the brain has around pain. Well, in, in terms of the garage athlete, the evolution of the garage athlete is going from very sagittal plane monotonous cyclical workouts to then a power athlete system. Mm-hmm. So welcome all that are joining Iron Flex here because you're getting out of the door frame. We're exposing you to different primal fun- fundamental foundational movement patterns, not just different X axes, different hinges, mm-hmm. a hinge represent squat, front squat, overhead squat, a deadlift, a sumo deadlift, high pull. Uh, I could go on and list the, 29 exclusive exercises, but I'm not going to get into it, but we expose you to then lunging, stepping up, marching, sprinting, jumping, rotating, twisting, bending through iron flex. Yep. And that sounds like a lot of variety to me, Tex. Oh, there's, I mean, there's an infinite combination of movements. That's the beauty of iron flex. Mm -hmm. It's like, okay, what barbell movement do we want to break down and tackle? Okay. Well, we got a lot to play with planes of motion orientations in space orientations. you could even take something like a spider-man where it looks like an extended lunge and start to move the head around maybe that they have to solve a task solve a problem close the eyes look up look down now you're changing the visual and vestibular well, let's start with breathing <laughs> all a part of the nervous system right? yes Paul. and within iron flex how it's written is is rather than rep schemes often lean on breath schemes mm. to steal miss lauren polivka LP DPT. That's her great handle. I know. Uh, so talk to us about the value of breath schemes and breathing Mm -hmm. rather than just saying, all right, I need three reps go. Well, I like to term this, the difference between working in versus working out. Okay. So whenever we're working out, everybody's pretty familiar with this one. Heart rate goes high, blood pressure goes up. You're getting sweaty. You're watching cops, you know, you get no idea there. You can't really digest food at that point. Maybe you get a little tunnel vision. You're working hard, okay? Versus this idea of working in, right? Where we don't necessarily get hot and sweaty. The heart rate doesn't get too jacked up. uh, And you're actually listening to your breath. Mm -hmm. Your breath then is going to be the driver of your movement. How far you can move into ranges of motion. How many reps that you can complete. What the time under tension looks like. What the volume and the sets look like. And you get into these positions and you do take a mental note. Like, can I actually breathe here? Yes or no? Answer that question. If you can't, you can try and take a big breath in there because it's the one part of our, um, you know, like the autonomic nervous system that we can control, right? We control what we're doing with our breath. We can override that sensation and we can force ourselves to breathe in that position. Or not. Or, or not, <laughs> right? Or not. I mean, I was at that sheepdog response course over the weekend and I got suffocated by Tim Kennedy. I could have chose to try and breathe there, but my body freaked out and I did not breathe. <laughs> it wasn't a tap out situation, just uncomfortable folks. Um, but that was a great example of my nervous system going into freak out mode. But even so with this idea of the iron flex stuff, your body might go into freak out mode though, but just understand that you are in control. You can change the outcome of that movement. And that also serves as a great barometer for our baseline for prog- progression and for success. Like, can I get into this pattern and can I breathe here now? Yes or no. It may not be that, you know, you have to necessarily overload it, but you can overload it with time under tension and taking breaths into those patterns. Like maybe I could do five full breaths here versus three that I did last week. That's a win. And then we can move forward from there. I like it. So how can people get the best, get the most out of this style of warm up experience? Oh, that's a, that's a great question. I think that, um, the first one would be to slow the fuck down <laughs> to take it slow. Seriously. Cause that's one of the big, um, I guess issues that I see when people start to implement this type of program, even with the, the rebuild programs that I write for people is that they go too fast. 
they kind of go through the motions nonchalantly as part of their warm-up so they can get to the meat and potatoes of the workout, right? Which I think is a huge mistake because there is so much value on working on those limitations at the beginning and really being able to slow down and tune in, okay? And then, like I said, and you can feel the nuances of the movement pattern. You can feel where you're limited. Right, we, I keep coming back to the Spider-Man position. I just love it so much because it is unilateral in nature, but it also just divulges so much information about the human body. Right. So, for example, even from there, if we have the left leg forward, is the shin vertical, or is it moving forward? Can you get there? Can the pelvis actually rotate? Does the arch of the foot flatten? Like we can start breaking this down. Oh yeah, hey, uh, and right? just quick note: when having my field athletes go through it, like adding the rotation or taking a base of support away. Mm -hmm. Now imagine we step that foot up and then I reach my right hand and my left hand overhead, like I'm flying like Superman. So I've got two bases of support, both feet. Where does that knee drift? I mentioned we want it out over in front of the toes as if we're in a good squatting position or change of direction. Do we start to see that knee drift back and the quad start to dominate this movement in their hamstring posterior chain turn off? Okay, well that's a biomarker for potential knee injury right yeah. there. So as That's an deal. example. Yes. Yes. And then I think you could also utilize this for what I like to term overcompensation. Mm. Right. So, you know, all those, those guys that drive around the big Duramax diesel trucks with the lift kit and the big oversized tires. No they're, idea what you're talking about. Well, they're overcompensating for something. I don't, I, mean, I don't think so. I, I think they're all people. accurately. <laughs> I mean, I know the qualifications for a big truck. They're not compensating for anything. I mean, Easy. I, I drive a small Tacoma. I'm just saying. <laughs> yeah, you're accurately portraying your uh, load. Your, what you sure. can carry. Let's just say that. Continue yeah, the joke. Continue. So anyway, now we'll move past the joke. We're, we're past that now. Um, that, that idea of overcompensation, we can now take the body into these extreme ranges of motion that's not used to going into. Now we joke all the time about exploring dark zones. This is a great way to explore some dark zones, right? The nooks and the crannies that your body's not used to going into. We are now taking your body. You just mentioned removing bases of support, right? That's a great way to induce a level of instability, which mm -hmm. in the brain and nervous system takes more seriously. It is then going to re-assimilate uh, the way the nervous system is oriented to try and adapt so you can maintain stability in that position. But you have to take yourself to the point of failure. You have to take yourself to the point of where you are going to fuck up, right? Because that's the only way that the nervous system and the brain will actually learn, right? And it's just something as simple as even walking. Like you watch somebody walk, many people don't actually get full hip extension. They kick the feet out to kick the leg out, almost looks like a waddle, right? Mm -hmm. So we can take somebody into what looks like a Spider-Man to give the brain an idea of what it looks like at the far end of the spectrum of hip extension because it is overcompensated. Like you never really have to access that hip extension when you're walking, but now it knows it can go there. And then what starts to happen is the, your, your brain and body are kind of like a pendulum swinging, right? If you're used to swinging only one end of the spectrum, now you can expose you to the opposite end, get that pendulum to swing farther, and the body will start to adapt to the point where it will self-organize into a brand new center, brand new center of balance. And then it becomes more efficient and more economical for your movement. And a big part of the reason why we still aim, even though this is a warm-up or equipment-less program, standalone to expose you to that barbell. Mm -hmm. So that only on Saturdays we bring the barbell into it because we've created a week worth of window and opportunity. Now let's load up and allow you the opportunity to explore under the highest, safest amount of stress that we can create within the weight room. Right. The barbell. And then even when you bring up the barbell too, like go back to the breathing, how much load is enough load, Tex? Enough load that you can challenge the posture and the position without to, changing. Yeah. It, boiling right? point, not breaking point. Boiling point, not breaking point. But also, can you breathe with that load? Wow. That's mm. an excellent question. I got one final question okay. for you. How is this different than yoga? Oh, boy. We had to go there, didn't we? Of course. <laughs> now, are we talking like hot yoga, Bikram yoga? There are so many different types of yoga. All right. Well, and, and, and I do yoga. So I'm going to speak, I, speak I from I too. My experience but, and, you know, yeah, every day I know those. you got I'm yoga just mats asking like, you frequently asked questions. Yeah. You got yoga mats all over your house, like in every I, room. Just, yeah, shut you, up. You make it no easy for yourself. Yeah. Lots of BOSU balls too, though. Can't figure out that one though. Um, but when it comes to the, all the yoga stuff, like I do yoga and I use it as a test for myself, right? I use it as like, 
hey, is my body becoming more efficient? Like, can I breathe through the transitions of all these patterns? And that is what yoga is supposed to be about. It's can you actually use your breath to control your patterns? Can you breathe with your movement? Mm -hmm. However, when you're in a hot yoga room, you're moving through a flow and the instructor's like sending out all these cues, moving different patterns, people just try to force their body into these poses. And when we force our body into the poses, we're always going to take the path of least resistance, which is usually found in utilizing our passive restraints, like our joint capsules, the limits of those ligaments, the, the soft tissue passive structures that aren't really designed to handle a lot of that load, right? We would much rather use the muscles and the tendons around the joint to control those positions. And this is where you start to see issues like, um, uh, low back pain is a big one in the yogi community, right? Because mm -hmm. they force their spine into all these folds and whatnot without actually controlling themselves. They don't use their feet to control their knees. And we see all these hip issues from it too, because you're just jamming the femur up into the acetabulum of the hip in an unconventional way versus something like the iron flex, where we can now slow things down and actually use the breath to control those positions. That is a prerequisite to an iron flex type of a program. Mm -hmm. I'm not trying to bash yoga people. This is not, yoga's great. I it can be utilized. Well, I'm just kidding. <laughs> but go on. <laughs> we got to do a yoga class together. Got one. I'll make you super flexy. Don't worry. Doing a handstand, motherfucker. Go on. <laughs> you know I'm good at the handstands. We do this all I day know. long. Yeah. But with the yoga stuff too, it's like you can then use that as an opportunity then to, to fill in those holes in your movement literacy. And it becomes now a benefit, a use stress versus a distress. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Yeah. And... People can do Iron Flex barefoot. Absolutely. And really start to feel. Yeah. So quick, quick highlight on yeah. the, the value, as you mentioned, with uh, the language, tension, expression, and, and movement there. So where can people start to feel mm -hmm. within their feet during Iron Flex? Yeah. So, I mean, yes, I advocate for barefoot training all the time with whatever you're doing. Mm -hmm. Some people still have a little bit of resistance to it. If we're weight training under load of a barbell, they feel a little sketchy with it. But you're right. The... Uh, the barefoot training during iron flex is a great opportunity to feel more, right? You can feel the ground underneath your feet, the texture of the earth, the texture of the, the surface that you're on, and then where the pressures are at, right? And that's kind of the key, right? If you feel a lot of weight back into your heels, this is likely going to make you more in that ligamentous dominance, right? That, that passive restraints, use a lot, utilizing those passive restructures for stability rather than the control of the joints, which is found in the forefoot. Mm -hmm. All the goodies in the feet are in front of the heel. Okay, all the different layers of muscles, all those sensory receptors in the skin found in more, mostly in that forefoot area. And that's what allows us to then control the positions of the knee and the hip and the spine moving up the chain, which is great because if you feel like your toes are coming up. And them down, see them. And see them too. You can see them. Like, is the knee going out of the toe? Well, if the knee is going out of the toe, we should see your arch starting to lower to the earth a little bit. Is your knee coming back? Are we transitioning out of the moving pattern? We should see the arch lift. Can you feel that? Can you take note of it, right? That's, these are all beautiful lessons that you can learn while being barefoot in those positions. Yeah. It's so opportunity to back into all the benefits that we discussed today by adding the iron flex as you are warm up. Mm -hmm. So you'll still get the, get your heart rate up, all the ACM, get your chili hot. Awesome. Check those boxes and aiming to improve your athleticism through a lot of things we discussed today. Yes, absolutely. Start to all fill right. in those gaps. Beaut and explore some dark corners. Or all the dark corners. Shine some light on those areas. Shine some light on those areas with Iron Flex. Absolutely. Beauty, seven day free trial. Give it a shot. Throw it in as your warm up or first thing in the AM when you wake up, if you train in the evenings or closing down your nights as part of your nighttime routine. Mm -hmm. Yeah, especially if you add the breath into there, those long, slow exhales before you go to bed, get you right and ready for sleep. Mm hmm. I mean, there's no Shavasana in there, but think of your eight-hour sleep as that. That's a Shavasana. It's a good Shavasana. Shavasana. Okay. <laughs> Namaste, Matt. Thank you for joining me Namaste. for Amen. Power Athlete Radio. Time. Bye. Bye.